Well, it's good to see each one of you this evening. It's a blessing to be together. And uh, just uh, very happy tonight that Ginger was able to come with me and thankful to always thankful to have her with me and to be with her. It's a tremendous blessing in my life. I tell you, it's really been hot out there, hasn't it? Hot and dry. It's just, I tell you, I, I don't know how much hotter and drier it can get. I really don't. As a matter of fact, it was so hot and so dry today that on the way up here tonight, you know, there's a big metal chicken out there. And those buzzards were over there trying to knock that metal chicken over. Y'all believe that? That's not right. That gives you a little insight <laughs> into my personality, which we just probably ought to leave right there. These elders, let's see, I think this, yeah, they're all smiling. I'm in good shape. That's good. That's good. I ain't running for the job. I'm just, I'm just here filling in. That's all. I'm just filling in. It's good to see y'all. And, uh, I, you know, I want to continue the theme. Uh, one fellow said, you had a patriotic sermon this morning. Well, it, it was in a sense because we're talking about spiritual freedom. And tonight we're going to talk about liberty. That Paul wrote to the church at Galatia because he was extremely concerned about the future for them. Uh, he said, if you look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, he said, I marvel that you're so soon turning away from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Paul had evidently heard that uh, the Galatians were listening to. They hadn't completely gone. Notice he says, you are turning. They were in the process of listening to somebody that Paul didn't think they ought to listen to. And so he wrote them to try to help them to make their future more secure in Christ. So he says, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He's, he's referring to himself because, you know, Paul was the one that did some preaching with, for these people in the area where these people lived. And he, he spoke about evidently they'd been hearing something that was uh, purported to be another gospel, some kind of a change to the gospel. Now, if we had time tonight, we would examine, you already know this because you've studied the book of Galatians, just like the book of Romans. It's about a particular problem that existed in that time. And that is that there were, there were Christians of a Jewish background who wanted to hold on to the law of Moses while they held on to Christ. And it had to be one way or the other because Jesus took that law out of the way and nailed it to his cross. He, he filled it full, the Bible says. And so they couldn't do that. But these people had a strong affinity for the law of Moses. And some of them just couldn't give it up. And some of them, we call them Judaizing teachers, they took the gospel and they put a little Jewish twist on it. Of course, that wasn't going to be acceptable to the Holy Spirit of God. Because that gospel, which is really not another, he says, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. See, you and I know, we know when you change the gospel, you pervert it. Gospel is not designed to be changed. Paul said he wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It was the power of God into salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. That's all we need is the gospel. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, we studied that this morning, 1 Corinthians 15, he said, if you stand in that gospel, you're saved by it. Just can't move away from it. Paul goes on to emphasize here, he says, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. A curse. It's a serious matter. Paul do, does not want these people to be led away from the gospel of Christ. And we don't want that to happen to us. We don't think it will. None of us get up in the morning deciding, I'm going to leave the gospel of Christ. But sometimes things happen. And we have to be on guard. When we read the letter, it becomes clear that it's this specific challenge of the temptation to go back to the law of Moses. And it becomes just as clear as it can be. And that would be spiritually disastrous for these people. It would be terrible if that happened with these people. And Paul didn't want it to happen. And it concerns him that it might happen. So uh, he said, don't do it. 
Just don't do it. So that's the purpose of the letter. Well, we're not tempted to go back to the law of Moses. So how does the letter help us? And there's not a single one of us in here is thinking about going back to the law of Moses. First of all, you couldn't if you wanted to because there's no temple to worship according to the law of Moses. Matter of fact, if you went over there and tried something like that, you'd find yourself in a world of trouble to try to worship according to the law of Moses on the grounds where that temple once stood. There's only one wall, and it's really not the wall. It's connected far enough down to a wall that was present at the time of Jesus and so forth. And there are people there that go to that wall, put their prayers in little cracks in that wall, and they stand there and pray. It's very very important to these people. Well, you can't worship according to the law of Moses anymore. Physically, it's impossible. And spiritually, it makes no sense whatsoever because it is simply a wasted matter of time. Even though we respect and love the Jewish people, we cannot worship God in that fashion during this Christian age. But there are some principles that are revealed in the book of Galatians that do help us. There's some principles revealed there because, you know, the, the Jews and the Christians in the first century, they were at a spiritual interface. You know, interface, that's one of those cool modern words, you know, the preacher, hey, the preacher said interface, you know, that's, that's something that you get in tech school and things like that. Well, the, the Jew, Judaism and Christianity were at an interface in the first century. They came up against each other. Well, it's no longer the case. Christianity has been in effect for a very long time. But each one of us has our own spiritual interface. We move from wherever we were spiritually to being a child of God, to being a Christian. We may have become a Christian as an adult, and therefore we had experienced a lot of things in the world, and, and that interface would, interface would be more complicated and more involved. Uh, than it would be for a child who comes out of the family of a Christian, of Christian people, and then becomes a Christian. That's a different interface. And then sometimes there are people who leave the church for a while and get away from their roots and get away from what ought to be doing, they ought to be doing, and they come back, and that's, that's their spiritual interface. That's where they change from one to the other. Everybody is coming from somewhere spiritually. Even those of us who are doing the best we can to be faithful to God every day, we still have those kind of interfaces. We're growing spiritually, aren't we? We're moving from, uh, hopefully, from a weaker to a stronger uh, state. Paul, uh, Peter said, rather, that we ought to grow in the faith and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's the interface of growth we continue to, to grow. And what Paul said to the Galatians would help them with their struggle. And I think if we take these principles and apply them to our lives, they can certainly help us. Of course, Galatians is structured like most of Paul's letters, all of them as far as I'm concerned. There's an initial section where these principles are revealed. And then there's a practical section, an application section that applies the principles that uh, we look at here. And so chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, all these, these are the principles being presented with regard to the superiority of the gospel of Christ over and against the law of Moses. Now, I will point out something here for you, and this may not have been a problem for you, you may not have even thought about it, but there are people in the religious world, in the Christian religious world today, who say that what Paul's arguing against in Galatians chapters 1 through 4 is not just the law of Moses, but any law. Say, Paul's arguing against any law. And they say that Paul is instead taking the position that we are completely free as Christians from any law. Of course, that can't be the case because there's a law of Christ. There's a law of faith in Christ. That's what the book of Romans says. And Jesus said himself, if you love me, remember that from a couple of weeks back? If you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Now, if somebody's talking about keeping their commandments, sounds like there's a law somewhere. Because commandments rise up out of law. And Jesus has a law. The difference is that it's a superior law to the law of Moses. 
So what Paul argues here is that we're under Christ now and we're not under the law of Moses. Now, I had the gentleman read, I think, one of the most powerful two verses. It's one of the most powerful couplets of verses that we find in the New Testament. Where Paul said at the conclusion of chapter 2, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, if you take Paul at his word, and we certainly should, because he's got the power of God and the Holy Spirit right behind it. We need to see that as children of God, it's not just us that's living now. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by Jesus' will, by Jesus' love. And so out of that, Paul says, I therefore do not frustrate the grace of God. And what would be frustrating the grace of God? Well, to say that, that righteousness came by the law, he said, then Christ is dead in vain. So we know that he's, he's dealt the death blow to the idea that, we're, that we can operate under the law of Moses. But just think about that. These people, they missed a very important point. Those that were falling under the spell of these that had come to teach them these things. They missed that they had gotten out from under the law of Moses. They missed it. They missed the fact that Jesus came to die to give them freedom freedom. That's what puts this lesson sort of along the line of the theme of this morning, freedom, real freedom, freedom from sin. Now, as I go up and down the road, I'll, I'll read the signs, you know, people put out in front of church buildings, and most of the time, they're pretty non-committal, not that bad, not that good. But this time of the year when it talks about being free from sin and attributing that to Christ, that's absolutely the truth. The only problem is you've got to do what Christ says for us to do in order to have that freedom. He's provided for us a gift, but we have to receive the gift. You remember the first time you started hearing gospel sermons? Go back in your mind a little bit. And uh, if you remember some of the old-time preachers, they would, talk, they would talk this way to try to get this point across. They, they, they take out a piece of money, maybe a $10 bill or a $5 bill. Wouldn't be much good these days, but a $10 bill or a $5 bill, and they say, uh, uh, I'm going to give this to you. All you have to do is to come up here and take it. And they might even have some young person come up, and, they, and then they'd pull it away from them. And they said, do you have that? Or they'd make the point, unless you come up here and take that money, it's not yours. You haven't received it. And so what God has done, he has provided for us a plan of salvation. You know, as a, as a man said here a few weeks ago, God's the architect, Jesus is the executor, and the Holy Spirit makes sure we knew about it. And that plan of salvation means that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that we turn away from our sin, we confess that faith in Jesus, and we're baptized into Christ to be raised to walk in newness of life. And that's that's first four chapters of the book of Galatians. It seems to me that Paul makes it, uh, makes it very clear that he's calling on the Galatians uh, for action. And I think that action is summarized in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. At least it, part of it is anyway. He says to the Galatian church, after he's gone through laying this foundation, this doctrinal work, he says, stand fast therefore. Now, you, one of my big things is whenever you see therefore in the text, you need to ask yourself a question. What's that therefore, therefore? And so what it's there for in this case is everything he said up to this time about not frustrating the grace of Christ is there for this purpose. He says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free 
and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now there is where the principle can apply to you and me. Don't become entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What was the Galatian church, the people there, what was their yoke of bondage? Their yoke of bondage was the law of Moses or the mutilated form of it that was being preached to them. He said, don't get tangled up in that again. Have you ever been tangled up in something? You know, the older I get, the easier I, it is for me to get tangled up in something. You know, I used to go to the doctor. Well, I still go to the doctor. I go to the doctor more than I used to. But anyway, one of the things they used to tell you at the doctor used to make me just a little bit upset. They say, now, Mr. Irby, as you're getting older, don't you hate it when they do that? That's the second worst thing I hate. The other one is now, Mr. Irby, you're getting a little heavier. I don't like that one either. But say, Mr. Irby, one thing you've got to do is you get a little bit older. Now, you've got to be sure that you don't have any loose rugs in your house. Now, some of you are laughing. You know what I'm talking about. They tell you, don't have any loose rugs. I said, what are you worried about? They said, well, you trip. People trip over loose rugs. Well, there ain't but one rug in our house that's not loose, and that's a carpet that's like this one. All the rest of them as loose as they can be. And if that's the case, I'd have to take up all the rugs and throw them away. And the rug in my bathroom, it trips me up almost every single day. But I'm not going to tell that doctor that, and if you see him, you don't tell him either. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Don't become entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Get your feet tangled up. Anybody here get your feet tangled up? I get tangled up all the time. And I can't get my feet to do what I want. But that's okay. That's okay. Eventually it works out. And, uh, you know, it's not that bad of a bruise when you fall. This word, therefore, it's a signpost in any kind of sermon or sermonic writing. Don't get tied up in the yoke of bondage. What about us? What about you and me? He was worried about these people who were saying to the church. They were saying to the church in the first century, in the case of the Galatians, do not buy this idea that the Gentile who's become a Christian has to become a Jew before he becomes a Christian. That's a, the key component. You've got to circumcise the Gentiles before you can baptize them. That's a key component of the Judaizing teacher. He didn't want them to do that. But for you and me, that's not a problem these days. Almost everybody around us is a Gentile. And we don't require anything of them other than that they obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we've got Bible for that. But there are a lot of things that we could become entangled again with. And we don't want to do that because we want to enjoy the liberty that Christ died to provide for us. You need to think about, again, think about the, uh, the Declaration and the Constitution, those documents, the founding documents of, of this country. Liberty. Liberty. That doesn't mean, it never has meant, the proper use of the term liberty has never meant that you were free to do what you wanted to do. You know, a lot of kids say, well, when I get to a certain age, I'm going to do what I want to do. And I tell them, no, you won't. You will not be doing what you want to do, not all the time. Because you're going to have to have a job, and during the time of that job, you're going to be doing what the man tells you to do. Or else you won't have a job very long. Liberty has never meant that you were completely free to do whatever you wanted to do. What liberty means is that you are free to do what's right. That you are provided the absolute opportunity by God Almighty in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to do the right thing. You are free to do that. That's what Jesus died for, provide for us. And, you know, for us in our immediate environment in this country at the present time, we're able to do that without fear of any kind of reparation. Freedom in Christ, liberty in Christ. We're free to do what's right. But there's danger out there. And the danger is that which uh, I believe Paul refers to in principle here. And I think about the kids. I think about the young people. And you've got some beautiful young people here. 
seem to be awfully smart, this bunch down here that was up front, and I know others are too, and uh, I know some of them personally, just wonderful people. The problem is uh, you go to church all your life. Sometimes when you finally do get out there in the world, that the siren call of sinful behavior gets a little strong, a little hard to resist. And you think, well, now I'm free from my parental oversight and I have liberty to do what I want to do. Just remember, when we get out there in the world, we, we don't want to become entangled with things such as the everlasting uh, pursuit of pleasure. Sexual pleasure, physical pleasure, drug pleasure, alcohol pleasure. So that's one thing people say, well, now I'm free, I'm going to do what I want to do. Now, let me tell you something. That doesn't work. I can guarantee it doesn't work. Because you think you're going to have a good time involved in pleasureful activities. But what's going to happen, that those pleasurable activities are going to weigh you down. And create a tremendous amount of difficulty for you. Now, I, I appreciate and I'm honored to know Christian young men and young women and, and middle-aged folks and older folks who've never taken a drink, who've never strayed from the path, who've always done what was right in terms of these particular matters. What Paul refers to in, in over here in the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 5, when he talks about the lust of the flesh and that sort of thing. And what, what uh, Paul refers to, and he says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Uh, for the love of the world is not uh, the love. If, if, if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then he says in verse 17 of 1 John chapter 2, And the world passes away. Now, I was nearly 30 years old before I learned any of that. Some of you were, too, older when you learned that. And so what we need to do is make sure that the young folks that we're around understand that the purity of life that they are experiencing, even though they may find it onerous, you say, Mama said I couldn't go to that party. Daddy said I couldn't go to that activity because it, the, I, I might get myself in trouble. That's a blessing. When you hear those words, no, no is oftentimes a blessing. Because some of us went to that stuff and it didn't work out well. See, entangled is a good word. And another thing, it's not just the idea of, of pleasurable activity. It's the idea of what's the most important thing in life. Well, you've got to make a good living. That's what people say today. You've got to make a good living. Well, you need to make a good living. V.P. Black said make all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Remember V.P. Black? That's what he talked about. about you know, that's, how you got, that's how you got in shape to give. How you get a place like this is because you had people that gave their money. But they didn't have any money to give unless they earned that money, so it's good to earn the money. However, that cannot be the end all. That cannot be the most important thing in life. Your success in business is not as important as your success as a Christian, as a child of God. Entangled is a good word. Popularity. How many of you are concerned about being popular? Well, some of us are so old we don't care about being popular. But there are a lot of people who do care about being popular. And they do a lot of things in order to ensure their popularity. You know, I'm old enough sometimes I still talk to my, my high school mates. You know, I talk to some of them from time to time. We talk about how silly we were and the things we did in order to be thought of as cool. You know what I found out? I found out I was cool anyway. I didn't even realize it till later. That's what you'll find out if you reflect upon it adequately. Don't worry about being cool. If you're not cool, you can't do anything to make yourself cool. You either are or you're not. And you will be if you will be. But the point is, we do not want to become entangled in the things of this life. The pull of the previous lifestyle for the child of God can be very, very strong. Old friends, old habits, and old comforts can look good to us particularly as we go through the rough patches in life, but we can't give in to them. 
And why can't we? Because of what Paul said and what we've had read to us. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. The life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When you ride down the road tonight, you're going back home, wherever you end up going, just remember this, you are free. You're not free from responsibility. Nobody is. You're not free from duty. Nobody is. You're not free from your relationship with God. Nobody is. Even those who refuse to enter into that relationship will ultimately one day, according to Philippians chapter 2, bow their head before the Lord. But you're free from the burden of sin. And you are a free will moral agent because God has made you that way and in terms of right and wrong you get to decide to follow God's will which is always right that's true liberty that's liberty I sometimes get a little upset and agitated when I see the folks in the media who are talking about nobody is going to tell me what to do you know, this, lately we talked about, we mentioned at least the Roe v. Wade being overturned. And somebody says, on these signs, it says, my body, my choice. You see no signs? I've got, I'm ready. I'm ready for an answer. Yes, ma'am. It is your body. It is your choice. But if a child is conceived within you, there is another body who's not able to make a choice. And it's your responsibility to protect that little body. This sounds crude, I know. I I used to work in those free clinics back in the 60s. This sounds crude, I know. Let me tell you something. Christ is the answer to that problem. When people start behaving themselves In terms of sexual interaction, the problem of abortion will go away. Somebody says, that sounds like a preacher. That's never going to happen. People are always going to do that. I I know some people who who never did that. I know a lot of women that slapped the fire out of somebody who tried some of that. Maybe we ought to return to fire slapping Maybe that would help the situation. Folks, liberty means you're always free to do what's right. And the thing tonight to do, if you've never obeyed the gospel, there's one right thing to do, and that's obey the gospel. To come in faith and turn away from your sin, confess Jesus is the Christ, be baptized into Christ, to be raised to walk in newness of life. That's the right thing to do, and it'll be a blessing to you. And if you've done that and you've kind of strayed and gotten off the path, you maybe had too much liberty for your own good, return to the liberty to do what's right and come back to the Lord. Because you know something about Jesus, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for that matter, they're always ready to forgive any of us if we'll truly repent. We pray the lesson's been a benefit to you. And if you need to respond to the God's gospel call, Please do so as together we stand and sing.